Welcome to iPad Pros, the show all about using your iPad to be productive and get work done. I'm Tim Chen, host of the show. This episode of iPad Pros is sponsored by OmniFocus. Learn more at OmniFocus.com. You know, our goal is not to try to solve problems that have already been solved well. It's to try to find solutions to problems that have not been solved at all, that just make people more productive. If they can be more productive by just switching to another tool, then maybe we should think about how best to work with that other tool rather than how can we replicate that tool's functionality inside our own app. Welcome back to another episode of iPad Pros. I'm really excited to have Ken Case from the Omni Group on to discuss their apps and a bit on some of the updates coming out this fall. I had the pleasure of interviewing Ken back when the iPad first launched in April of 2010. This was just a few weeks after the original iPad launched. The 3G model had not even hit store shelves yet at that time. That nearly two hour interview from 2010 is now available for Patreon supporters. And if you tune in after the exit music of this episode, you can hear a little clip of that conversation. Sign up today by going to patreon.com slash iPad pros to listen to that interview today. Thanks again to OmniFocus for sponsoring this episode. Now, on to my interview with Ken Case, the CEO of the Omni Group. Welcome to the podcast, Ken. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Uh, so can you first introduce yourself and kind of what role the iPad plays in your life today? Sure. Well, uh, I'm Ken Case of the Omni Group. We make productivity software uh, to try to help people be more productive every day. And so that is how I mostly use my iPad, although actually I use iPads for different activities. But at work, I use the iPad, uh, you know, to take notes on, use it to, you know, build outlines and structures and uh, review notes and do communications, anything where I want to do something mobile uh, and a small screen seems appropriate. And I just love it. I use it. I've used it pretty much every day since the iPad shipped. Awesome. And then we're going to dive into all the different apps that your company makes. Can you first kind of dive into how you use the various Omni apps in your day-to-day personal and work life? Sure. We have four major apps that we use all the time. Uh, and on the all of them are available on the iPad. OmniFocus is our personal task management app. This is what I use to keep track of little notes about things I need to get done through the weeks and years. Like I put uh, my passport renewal a reminder in there over 10 years ago, and that finally came up this year. Uh, Omni Outliner is a tool that I use constantly to just structure my thoughts in outline form. Omni Graffle is a diagramming and sort of symbolic drawing tool. And you know, I, I sometimes think of it as the drawing tool for people who can't draw. <laughs> so it's built to make it easy for you to line things up and put in symbolic content. Uh, often the uh, the content that I put into OmniGraffle is, like, it's not sketches and things. It's more something where you have text combined with shapes and yeah. often connections between them and so on. And then OmniPlan is our project management tool for very structured projects where you know in advance a lot about what you're planning to do and what the steps are. That tends not to be a daily life sort of a thing as much as a, oh, okay, I need to plan out the next six months of a project or two years of a project and what are the steps I need to get done along the way. And particularly if you know the steps incredibly well, then then it can be a great tool to help you optimize what order they happen in. Yeah. With OmniGraffle, is that a tool you guys use internally for sketching out the future UI of different products you're working on? We do, yeah. We often will swap mockups back and forth that, you know, here's how we think this this piece of the app should look and here's what should flow into the next piece. Uh, and so it's been really great for that. Awesome. So let's dive into OmniFocus first. That's the one I probably use the most at this point in my life. And it started its life as a pretty pure getting things done solution. And it's evolved over the years to be good for both that market of getting things done users, as well as kind of general task management. Can you kind of speak about how it's evolved over the years? Sure. Well, we've always, it came from Omni Outliner, which was, you know, a very general purpose outlining tool. But uh, and we had made Outliner so flexible that some of our customers had taken it and started building this getting things done solution around it. So that's why, you know, when we saw that was happening, we thought, oh, well, maybe we should make Outliner an even better tool for scripting and so that customers can do this even better. And as we looked into what this was about and what 
uh, what they were wanting, we realized, well, really what would be nice is if you had an easy way to do all of these integrations that getting things done would ideally have you do built into the tool in the first place. But that's not really Omni Outliner. Maybe it's time to build a new app. And that's how we ended up creating OmniFocus. So, you know, things like being able to press a keystroke. This started life on the Mac, obviously came to the iPad when the iPad shipped. So being th able to quickly capture and send things to OmniFocus from any app, uh, you know, was one of the early focuses. And being able to have you know, reminders, time-based reminders that would come back and tell you, hey, this thing is, is becoming due. But then, as you said, it was based around the GTD workflow, which has a notion of sort of projects with goals and then context, the, you know, the tools and so on that are needed to achieve those goals. You can plan things out in one dimension, thinking about what your goals are. And then as you look at those individual items and you think about, well, what tools do I need to be able to achieve that? You assign a context to each one of those things. And then when you go and flip things around and look at your context list, you can say, okay, well, I'm in the context of being at work. Here are the things I can do at work. Or now I'm running errands. What are the things I can do on errands? And it's kind of a nice way to slice and dice your tasks in, in two different dimensions to help you get more things done, be more efficient. So that is where OmniFocus started life. Uh, we quickly started hearing from customers saying, oh, well, can I assign things to more than one context? And we're like, well, that doesn't sound like, you know, strict GTD notions of, of what a context is. But as we kept using it over the years and people kept asking for this, we realized, oh, that makes sense. Maybe we should just call it something different. Context is not the most approachable word anyway. So we, uh, in OmniFocus 3, which we shipped last year, we renamed that to tags or we sort of replaced the feature with tags, uh, which means you can tag things with whatever tags seem appropriate to you. Maybe it's a person that you need to talk to and meet with about something, or maybe it's a tool that you need, or maybe it's a combination of the above. And that combined with our custom perspectives lets you sort of slice and dice things to say, here's my perspective for the next time that I meet with Molly at work or whatever. Awesome. And then what kind of tags do you end up using in your own database? The most used tags for me, in fact, are those personal tags. Here's somebody I need to talk with about something. A lot of things in my database and don't need tasks at all. You know, a lot of the work that we do these days can be done almost anywhere, you know, with our mobile devices, with the computers that we have with us on the go, or, or that I'm just in front of the computer so often that right. <laughs> it seems like a silly thing to tag everything with. Like um, Most of my work needs to get done yeah. there. I used to use a lot of those more tool-based tags. I still have them in my database, but I really don't use them and I don't assign them to most of my new tags anymore. I just mostly pay attention to here are the people that I need to interact with to get something moving forward or to report something uh, back to them so that they understand what, what the status gotcha. is. Gotcha. And then one of the pro features, so there's both the standard version and a pro version of OmniFocus. Uh, one of the pro features is forecast tags, which the forecast is one of the, my favorite innovations you guys have had in years with OmniFocus, kind of laying out the week ahead of you. And forecast tags let you put things in that forecast without a due date. So how does this work? Is it a separate section of the forecast or does it just follow you day to day until you finish it? How, how is this? Sure. Well, one of the problems that we realized we wanted to solve was that a lot of people, they liked using that forecast view as their dashboard for the day because it, it really had, here are the things that I need to get done today. And uh, we also had calendar integration so you could see the calendar appointments that you had for the day. And it was kind of this one place you could go for everything. But because it was this one place you could go for everything, people started saying, oh, well, I want this to show up in forecast, so I'm going to add a fake due date <laughs> today uh, because I want that to be on my forecast every time I, that I look at it. And so that leads, you know, if you have fake due dates mixed with real due dates, then suddenly you don't know which things are real and which ones are fake <laughs> unless you, you know, somehow mark it differently, you know. It just ended up being a lot of work. And then you have to keep moving those dates along because you missed that date because it wasn't a real date. And so now you have all these overdue things and then you're pushing them forward and saying, okay, well, now they're going to be due today. And it ended up being a messy workflow. And, and we really wanted to solve that when we were thinking about OmniFocus 3. So the thing that we did was add this forecast tag to the Pro Edition that you say, I, I just want to add this particular tag to items that now show up in forecast and they just get listed in your forecast after the things that have hard de due deadline. It's like th things that are really actually due today, clearly you need to get them done today first. And so we list those first. We list your calendar appointments so that you have that context as well. But then we show you a list of all of the things tagged with your forecast tag. And if any of those things don't happen to get done on that particular day, well, they'll follow with you to the next day. So when you look at the forecast again tomorrow, if that item is not checked off, it's still sitting right there waiting for you. Awesome. 
And something I just was thinking of as you were talking about that is in the review of OmniFocus, when you go through all the tasks that are kind of still on your agenda, is there a way to easily add a forecast tag during that review process, like swipe a certain direction, you get a forecast tag, so it's there on your, let's do this, let's knock this out? Yes, exactly. So if you have assigned a forecast tag to your data, like forecast tags are not part of this sort of built-in workflow, like we didn't pre-build a tag for you. The process is you go into forecast and you go into its sort of view section, you tap on view, the view icon, and one of the configuration options there is what tag do you want to see in forecast? Well, once you have done that on your iPad, as you're looking at any list of tasks, you can just swipe on that task and it will offer to add that forecast tag to you. So it's really quick and easy to add you know, an item at a time as you see it there and say, oh, okay, I need that to show up in my forecast until it gets done <laughs> or until I take it back off the list give up give up on it yeah nice so it's not something you're typing in every time you want it and then the other thing that can happen is if you were looking at a view and all of these things need to go on forecast at once you could use the ability to multi-select objects so you go into editing mode you tap on several items and then you hit the inspector and say okay i want to add this tag to all of them at once yeah the multi-select thing was new in version three right and it really does make uh kind of batch editing really really nice yeah, that was a, you know, people had seen this already in on the Mac side of things because we've always had it there. But it was one of the top requests to bring back to iOS and particularly on an iPad where you can see a lot of things and you want to act on them all at once. And then I'm curious, uh, so the different versions of OmniFocus, you guys do a good job of like optimizing for the platform. The watch is very special for the watch, iPhone, you know, very iPhone-y. Um, the iPad version, what about it? What aspects of it do you like the most out of it? Well, the thing we really optimized for with the iPad was the review experience, where you're taking this thing, you're sitting down over your, your beverage of choice and just kind of getting a chance to... And this is kind of a GTD-centric view of the world, but this review process of getting clear and kind of reviewing the things that, that are going on in your life and relaxing with it and saying, okay, well, these things need to get done. It's less good right now, not as well optimized for just entering a bunch of new tasks, at least directly in the app. One of the things that we have worked on over the last few years is adding automation to our apps. And so now it's possible to add things to a, you know, a whole project at once from a template, for example, and say, okay, I'm going on a trip. And you know you've gone on plenty of trips before. And here are the sorts of things that you need to pack. And maybe there are a few extra things, but most of it's going to be exactly the same. You have similar schedules involved. And so have the shortcut set up where you tell Siri that you're going on this trip and it will run through this whole shortcut workflow and add a bunch of a whole project out to your uh, to your OmniFocus database and have it all set up. But that's not quite the same as, you know, just being just sitting in a Mac and typing into an outline. And every time you hit return, you, you can type another item really quickly. And so the, you know, the workflow has been optimized differently for different platforms. And then something new this year in 3.3 was this whole dropped actions feature. You're not deleting the action, it's still in your database. Who is this for and what, what's this for? Sure. Well, we've always had a notion of dropped projects because sometimes you're working on something and you've done some work on it, but you realize, oh, you know what, I don't need to do this anymore. I'm going to drop it. But maybe you have invested effort in it and it's worth trying to you know, keep an archive of it and remember the, what you did do if you need to refer to it later on another project, perhaps. Or if the project somehow comes back, then that's another reason to do it. People have asked for dropped individual actions before to be able to do the exact same thing with individual actions. It, it sort of mattered less there because, you know, the reason we didn't do it that way in the first place is because an individual action in an OmniFocus database in theory shouldn't have a lot of information associated with it the way a project might, and information and planning and investment. So it seemed less important. The reason it became important now, though, and the reason we decided to do it this year is if you are collaborating on a project with somebody else and you have a number of actions that you're splitting between the two of you, it's really important to be able to communicate, hey, I decided not to do this thing after all, and I'm dropping it. <laughs> so that then they can look at it and understand what should happen next, as opposed to just deleting it, in which case it would disappear or, you know, break the link and they wouldn't know what was going on or marking it done, which, you know, is one way to get it out of your to-do list, but it doesn't really accurately communicate to the person <laughs> right. you were working with what actually happened yeah. with that thing. And collaboration is something you've mentioned 
on the blog in the past is something you'd like to implement one day is this dropped actions kind of like a stepping stone into that or kind of where does that stand yes that's exactly why it was done right now it's uh we're we're very actively working have been very actively working on collaboration now uh it was on last year's roadmap and it's on this year's roadmap and it, at this it may, it may also be on next year's <laughs> roadmap you know I, ios it, it is a big project and uh and of course every year we get a new version of ios which, which is its own big project to go with yeah so so right at the moment we had to you know we released the drop action support just around the time that ios 13 became available to developers at the beginning of summer since then our attention has been focused on trying to get the iOS 13 features in order before that ships this fall. So Yeah, they threw a lot at developers this year. Collaboration work is on hold. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> at the moment. But it will be picked up again this fall. Excellent. And what are, kind of wrapping up OmniFocus, what are some of your favorite features that make it overlooked at times by people using the app? In, in some ways, I'm so close to it that I <laughs> just <laughs> don't remember what it is that, that people may find surprising about it. But some of, the, some of the things that I think people often overlook is that it's really, and you know, we tried to make it easy when you're in the app to add something wherever you want it to be. So you, there's a plus button in the bottom right-hand corner, and it should be uh, you know in, in your toolbar. It's sort of a highlighted plus button. And you can press and hold on that pr plus button and start dragging it up into your list. So you can drag that wherever you want it to go in your list and drop it there. And now you've got an item that's sitting right there. A related thing is that all of our project lists support hierarchy. You know, this did come out of Outliner after all. And so you can create an outline of tasks and say, well, here's a thing that I need to get done. I need to pack my clothes for this trip. Well, what does that mean? And so you now have sub tasks that are, uh, I need to pack my socks, I need to pack my shoes, you know, whatever you need to get done. And great thing about having subtasks is you can say, if you check off the parent item, they all get implicitly checked off. Or if you drop the parent item, they all get implicitly dropped. You know, those sorts of things can be done in one fell swoop. Uh, and it gives a little bit of extra structure to your list of items. Yeah. So those are two big things. And uh, just drag and drop in general, taking, like, being able to drag a task off to another app, you can drag it to a mail message or something and have it turn into text uh, in task paper form over there and send it to somebody else. And then they can drag it back into their OmniFocus to add it there. And you drop it in the inbox or in a project or doesn't does it matter? Uh, in the inbox or in a project or you know anywhere that you could normally drag tasks within the app. And then anything else about OmniFocus before we move on to Omni Outliner? Uh, let's move on. We've got plenty, plenty to talk about, I guess. Yeah. So Omni Outliner, purpose-built for outlining. For those that haven't used it, what does that mean? What is being purpose-built for an outliner versus just general text entry apps? So text entry, you know, obviously I've been using a text editor as long as I've been using a computer. But, well, is that really true? <laughs> I guess uh, way back on the Atari 800, they didn't have very good text editors. <laughs> but, and neither did punch cards. But anyway, so uh, in a text editor, you are manipulating words, you're manipulating paragraphs. An outliner is a lot like that. You're manipulating words and paragraphs, but they have structure to them. So a paragraph can have child paragraphs. And if I drag something underneath you know, one paragraph underneath another. Now, if I decide I'm going to move these things around, like I want to move that parent item around, I'm restructuring. Let's say I'm writing a paper. Uh, I'm going to come up with the point, the major headline topics for my paper, and then I'm going to start fleshing in that structure a little bit. So I, you know, might type on here, what are my goals, and write some stuff down there. What now is this section about? And then start writing paragraphs of content there. If I move that section header around, all of the content comes with it automatically. And I can collapse and you know, show and hide those sections. So that makes it an easy way to navigate my document, kind of see things at a high level or quickly expand things to see all of the details. And uh, this is something that ends up being really loved by people who are working on research projects doing dissertations, people who are students out there, or, you know, particularly grad students. Lawyers love it, and they, legal works often involves a lot of sort of deep outlines, like in contracts and so on. You'll see 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.7, or whatever. <laughs> and, and an outline naturally lends itself to that kind of structure. It has support for Harvard notation or legal notation for, for how those bullet points are organized and so on. Yeah. And then recently, I guess within the past year or two, I'm not sure exactly when, but the Essentials version launched for iPads, more a basic version of the Outliner. Uh, who is that for versus the old standard Pro version that was out there? So the old version, 
well, I, I wrote actually a whole blog post about what the <laughs> essential version is, is out there for. It's really to help people who are new to outlining get to be exposed to it, learn it, start to use it, and, and hopefully fall in love with it and see, understand what the category is about. Because a lot of people don't understand necessarily why would I use an outlining app rather than just putting stuff into Microsoft Word and doing my outlines there. Until they start using it, and then they find out, oh, this is really great. And now I wish I had these extra capabilities. And of course, those extra capabilities are available there in the, the Pro Edition. Yeah, and it's just an in-app purchase if you do want to get the Pro right. version. Yeah, and that that's something you guys do really well. I know um, with like upgrade pricing, I, I found upgrade pricing for an app I bought in the original Omni Graffle for iPad version one. You still get upgrade pricing at version three <laughs> if it's installed, which you can still install it as a for a license key kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. That was something that we worked a number of years on to figure out how can we offer upgrade pricing in the App Store? How can we offer you know free trials for so people can use our apps for two weeks before they try them? In one of our earlier conversations in a podcast yeah. you know, years ago, I think we had a conversation about uh, our money-back guarantee policy that we had at the right. time and, and how we were applying that to iOS and the App Store. And uh, I think you said that that was very brave of us. <laughs> and I said, well, that doesn't really replace being able to do, use, do trials and so on. But, you know, what can we do? The App Store doesn't support trials. Yeah. Well, over time now, the App Store does have much better support for in-app purchases and the flexibility there. So we've used that and leveraged that to be able to offer trials and upgrade discounts. And, uh, and now we're also starting to offer subscriptions. This is wandering a field from Outliner, of course. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, but OmniFocus has a subscription available for people who prefer that model but it's optional right yeah and that gets you the web version all the other mac and all, all the versions so omni outliner kind of was what kicked off omni focus are there other non-traditional uses of omni outliner that you're seeing used today well so one of the things i don't know whether i call it traditional or not it it's if you're using the pro version you can have multiple columns of information so not only do you have your outline of things, but each entry in the outline can now have a second column or a third column or or five more columns of extra details about it. So people use this for things like book lists or, you know, here are all of my fiction books and then, and then subcategories maybe sort of grouped by author or maybe the author is a column and then uh, you can sort by that column later. You know, so there are lots of different options there. I personally uh, enjoy using it and always have to plan out sort of financial budgets. So if I'm thinking of here's the revenue stuff and here's a breakdown of where that stuff is coming from and then individual items in those extra columns, you know, I'll have a column that represents the money involved and I can set that column to automatically total the child items into the parent. And so that lets me now use this outline to quickly expand and expand things more and see the extra details or collapse things and just kind of get the high level overview of, of what's going on with, with that particular set of financial data. Gotcha. Yeah, that's that's certainly a different way to use an outline. That's yeah, that's that's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so automation you mentioned earlier. Can you dive into automation a bit more? I know Omni Outliner now supports it, and there's a whole automation console. There's a way to save these, so you can come back to them kind of from the same file picker area you'd, you'd get to when you start the app. So yeah, automation. How how does it all work? Sure. So automation has a long history with our apps on the Mac side of things, but we weren't sure how to bring some of those capabilities over to iOS when we when we did our initial you know launch of our apps uh, as the app store opened as we ended up spending time with it you know we wanted to bring these capabilities over to iOS and looking at what our options were that were available it looked like javascript as an embedded prog programming language would be the best choice for us you know it was a language that you know the most popular scripting out there since it's the language that web pages use and a lot of people know it and Apple spends a bunch of time making sure that it's secure on iOS and making sure that it's really fast. So we built what we call Omni Automation, which is a set of technologies that let us run JavaScript inside our apps and have it talk uh, through a secure bridge over to our object models. So people can, you know, when they're writing some JavaScript code, they can refer to projects and actions in Omni Focus, or they can refer to rows of information in Omni Outliner, and you can talk about the parent rows and the child rows, and uh, you know, what is the value for this row in this column, and 
you know, get the data out, put data into it. You know, this ends up being really rich. Obviously, we already had that support on the Mac, so we've seen what people had done with it there, but it wasn't cross-platform. The AppleScript technology that it was based on there is only available on a Mac, and there was no way to offer that to people on iOS. So we're very excited now to have it available in most of our apps on iOS. You know, the last one that we're bringing to it right now is actually OmniFocus, and it's in testing. Well, go ahead with some of the specific questions that you had. Oh, yeah. So the console, how does... I understand you enter a text and it runs the automation. Is that where you end up building the automations? And how do you actually save the automations once those are written? Sure. The console is mostly meant as a way to experiment with things and try them out, not not to write a lasting automation of some okay. sort. So it's a good place to, uh, because it's interactive, you can just interact with things right then and there and say, okay, well, how would I get from my document down to this particular value that I'm seeing in the document? Uh, and you can explore that through the console. But what you really are better off doing is setting up a side-by-side text editor. If once, once you're ready to start working with this in detail, you can open another window that has a text editor in it, and particularly if it's a nice JavaScript editor where it'll do color formatting for you and syntax coloring and yeah. all that stuff. Have it side by side with Omni Outliner, and then you can, as you find things that work in the console, you can paste it into your script on the other side. Do you think that approach will change with multi-window support? Will the console become, you know, be updated to be more than experimentation and kind of more, you'll have that side by side with Omni Outliner, your main document? I think there's certainly opportunity there for automation to live there. That won't be in our very first iteration because we're just scrambling to get documents right. side by side. <laughs> right. And so as we think about, okay, you've opened a document in this iPad window and now another document in this other iPad window, automation has to understand which document it's talking to. In our beta ver- um, internal sort of mm-hmm. test flight builds, the way that works is based on which window you're in and which document is open in that window. Right. And so that's how the automation knows what document context it's running. Gotcha. But I agree, ultimately, it would be great if in s- you could drag that automation console off to its own window or say, I uh, you know, just tap a button that would, that would spawn a separate window and then it could talk back to that main document, especially because you may want to write scripts that talk to multiple documents at once. And that's, that is possible now, yeah. but it's a little bit awkward with that automation console. Gotcha. And then how do you save it to the main, you open your document picker and you have some automations to pick from? Because of sandboxing, any app on iOS really only has direct access to the things inside its, its own sandbox. But you can, in iOS 13, you can say, I would like to add another folder of information that this app can access. So what's coming up in in our iOS 13 builds is a way to say, here's another folder that I'm storing some automation plugins in. Uh, You know, maybe it's an iCloud folder and it's called Omni Automations or something. And then when you're in Omni Outliner, it's allowed to scan that folder and read the uh, any content that you place inside it. And that means that Omni Outliner can now add these extra plugin actions to its uh, plugin run menus and so on, so that you can quick, you know, quickly get to any of those and run the content. So that means you, in this side-by-side scenario, you can have your text editor, uh, say, on the right and Omni Outliner on the left, and you type some stuff in the text editor. As soon as you press save on that side, or however you trigger it in writing those changes to disk, then on the outliner gets a notification that hey this file has changed it can reload that plugin and now the new code is ready to run with just the, the tap of a button before we dive into the rest of my interview with ken i want to share just a bit on his favorite aspect of the ipad version of omnifocus omnifocus's review feature is how you stay on track it's the easiest way to prevent things from going off the rails in case you don't know about omnifocus it's a great app for managing everything you have to do at work and in your life it's great on iPad, and it's also great on iPhone, Macintosh, and the web. Back to review. OmniFocus prompts you periodically to review all your projects. You're in control of how often. It could be every week, every other month, whatever you want. And you can have a different setting for each project. Some projects might need more frequent review than others. When it's time for review, OmniFocus presents you with the project or projects to review. That's your chance to make sure that everything in the project belongs there. You could drop some actions that no longer need doing. You could add some actions that have come up recently. You might find that the project needs some larger restructuring, or you just might find that some of the due dates need tweaking. Then, when you're finished, you tap the Mark Reviewed button and then move on to the next project to review until you're finished. 
The review feature makes sure you have confidence in your system. You look at everything and make sure it's all up to date. And this is how you can trust OmniFocus. When you're in forecast, looking at today, and it tells you what's next on your list, you know it's correct because you've used the review feature. To learn more, go to OmniFocus.com and download your 14-day free trial. Thanks again to OmniFocus for sponsoring this episode of iPad Pros. Go to OmniFocus.com to try it for free. The file browser is being shifted from your own custom one to the standard iOS browser. So what big advantages does that give you moving to the, I guess, the UI everyone's familiar with, with Apple's uh, new files app and, and that being in the app? Sure. Well, the biggest thing that it gives us is the ability to browse these other locations that are outside our sandbox. So in the past, Omni Outliner's main file browser would only show you the files that were within its sandbox. Or, uh, you know, again, this is sort of stuff that was within its sandbox, but it was they were synced locations that we have our own syncing technology called Omnipresence that we built because nothing else worked yet. And so, so we had to build something on our own to let you sync documents from one place to another. The ability to sync your documents around is a core feature, absolutely, of mobile use of our apps. But what technology you're using to do that, as long as it works, is not, you know, we're agnostic about. In our new version, with uh, using Apple's file browser instead, you'll just see the same list of locations along the side that you've customized in the Files app. And you can say, I want this stuff to be stored on iCloud Drive, or I want this stuff to be stored in Dropbox, or, uh, or wherever you want it to be. I should caution that Dropbox actually has an issue that will corrupt our files for package files. Okay, that's one of the yeah. reasons that we didn't build in support for it directly. To try to help make our documents compatible with Dropbox, we also have been working on adding flat file variants of them, which mean that basically we have zipped up our content in a way that is now Dropbox compatible. Uh, so it's slower than read and write, but it's more portable. Gotcha. And then open in place is supported by Omni Outliner. Is the main use of that, is is that for users that want to do an OPML version of their file and kind of be editing an outliner and have that reflected in the mind map place that also supports open in place? Or what's the big use case for open in place? Well, it really ties into this business of being sort of agnostic about how you're syncing your files. So with open in place, you can just go to anywhere on your iCloud drive, see an outliner document there, tap on it, it opens an outliner and you start editing it. And when you save, it gets saved back to iCloud drive where, right where it started. And that's what open in place means. It's as simple as that. It lets you edit uh, documents wherever they are. So in some sense, you can get some of the benefits that I just talked about with the new file browser that we're integrating into our apps. You can already get that today in iOS 12 by just using the Files app to select your outliner documents. And when you want to edit them, you, you tap on them there instead of going through Omni Outliner's file picker. Gotcha. And then uh, moving to Omni Graffle, the Apple Pencil is a thing now since the iPad Pro came out. How has that changed how Omni Graffle... Uh, is interacted with, I guess, and, and used. It just makes it much more precise to be able to place things on a canvas using a more precise <laughs> instrument than, than your very wide finger <laughs> right. compared to the you know a pixel on the screen. So uh, that's really nice. You can see where something is going as you're dragging it and so on. We've always had tools in place to try to make it easy to do that even with just your finger. So you could zoom in quickly, move something around with your finger now that all of the pixels are 100 times larger or whatever. Not, not 100 times maybe, but well, maybe. <laughs> um, and then uh, and then bring it back down. I guess 1600% might be our maximum yeah. zoom in level right now. But with the pencil, you can do this precise work while not zooming in, which means you can still see the context of what else is going on the screen. Uh, of course, some of the other stuff that we've had built in that helped with finger alignment of things, like auto snapping into place of things as they say the left edge of an object lines up with the left, of, left edge of another object, the two will kind of snap into alignment. That's obviously great when you're moving it with your finger. It also is helpful with the pencil. But one of the fun things that you can now do with the pencil that you really couldn't do at all with the finger is draw a shape and have it, have it look sort of right, semi reasonable. Yeah. So you can draw a square or a circle or whatever and we have a shape recognition mode that we specifically built for the pencil and as you draw a square then we will recognize what you drew and turn it into a real square or a real rectangle or a real circle and what i mean by real is uh not sketched out with sort of weirdly angled lines and so on yeah. but it'll kind of snap all of the geometry into place gotcha 
And then one of the pro features I noticed are the art boards and artboard layers. How do these work and kind of what situations are these most useful for? So I guess there are a couple of different ways that they get used. But one of the ways that I found that they're most useful is if I want to set up some export regions. Like I'm doing a diagram. Let's say I'm diagramming an interface. So I have the toolbar going across the top and I have the inspector on the side and the navigation bar on the other side. I have all these areas sort of laid out. And now somebody says, that's great. I'm ready to work on a piece of that. And I would really like to see the art from that. You can use artboards to mark regions of the canvas that you would like to export individually and say, okay, well, this icon really should be its own export to you know, a 32 by 32 zone. Instead of having to export it out to one big canvas and then take that into some other image tool to slice and dice all of the pieces, you can now mark those areas using artboards and, and export them that way. And then something I noticed is the ability to kind of modify fonts, morph characters to be just right for what you're trying to do. With iOS 13's kind of font support, have you guys considered allowing users to kind of export their own custom fonts based off these morphed characters you're able to build in OmniGraffle? Oh, that would be a lot of fun. It would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I hadn't actually thought about that. That sounds really pretty fun. The, as I think about it now, you know, we actually worked on a font editor many, many years ago, back on the Next platform. The challenges, of course, are, at least that we were dealing with at the time, were which font format do we pick? Well, now that, that's a little more obvious. Fonts are actually little programs that you're writing. And I don't know how you would necessarily do some of the advanced tweaking of here's how this should look at different sizes and so on. Yeah. If you were just exporting from OmniGraffle, but it might make a fun starting point and take to another tool, or maybe you don't need it at multiple sizes. So it's okay. To, <laughs> or you, it's okay to just let it scale in whatever its default scaling mode yeah. is for this stuff. And then any hidden gestures that users should be aware of when using OmniGraffle? Oh, there are far too many hidden gestures. We actually just reviewed, we were reviewing a bunch of the gestures because, you know, iOS 13 now adds some new gestures built into the operating system for things like undo and for copy and paste and so on. And how many of these conflict with some of the gestures that are maybe more subtle that are in our list? We we try not to just hide gestures. We actually have them listed in our documentation. <laughs> so we went back to our documentation. We were look, looking through the list there of, you know, what are the gestures and what do they do? And the funny thing was some of us didn't even remember what some of those gestures did anymore. They're like trying to read that like, okay, you do what now? And what happens? <laughs> and how does that work? Uh, maybe we can just get rid of that. Does anyone actually even use that? And then we tried it in the app and it turned out it was actually broken and had been for who knows how long. <laughs> and so clearly nobody at Omni uses it and maybe nobody in the outside world either or they would have mentioned right. something yeah. about it being broken. So it was documented but not working. Sorry about that to anyone who was using it. Uh, so we are simplifying those gestures down. You know, as we started uh, on the iPad that's really when we came up with that list of gestures initially. And we didn't know what would make sense or not. because From usage, we had to just kind of think about it in our heads. We didn't even have an iPad available to work with when we first started designing what our gestures were. Now that we've had a number of years of experience, it's a lot easier to kind of see here are the gestures that get used, here's what's discoverable or not. And so we're looking forward to simplifying <laughs> our gestures in in, Omni. in fact, we've already, in our internal test flight builds, we've already simplified it. And it makes the code much simpler, which makes the gestures more reliable to execute or faster to use. Yeah. And it should be a lot of fun. Awesome. And then the other thing I was just thinking of uh, beyond the font idea was, have you guys considered a mind mapping mode for OmniGraffle that would kind of integrate with Omni Outliner? Or is that kind of not what uh, the app is for, I guess? We have considered it. It's not far from what the app is for. You know, the app is for... Uh, symbolic thinking and drawing yeah. and so on. And so mind mapping does fit right in there. And we've had requests for, for mind mapping on both the Mac and, uh, well, on the Mac going back probably 15 years or more. And on iOS more recent. Uh, obviously, the platform doesn't go back that <laughs> right. far. But, but as long as the platform goes back and... Uh, and yes, we've we've had requests for it there too. I think there are some great mind mapping tools out there who specialize in, in that stuff. And so there was a time where I thought, okay, there's this market gap and it makes sense for us to try to plug that hole and maybe, you know, when we get a chance, let's look at that again. But now with such great tools out there, I'm not sure it does make sense. You know, our goal is not to try to solve problems that have already been solved well. It's to try to find solutions to problems that have not been solved at all, that just make people more productive. If they can be more productive by just switching to another tool, then maybe we should think about how best to work with that other tool rather than how can we replicate that tool's functionality inside our own app. Right. So let's move ahead to OmniPlan. In OmniPlan Pro, there's a multi-user project sync feature. How does this work and how are companies using this to keep kind of everyone on track for finishing their projects? Sure. Well, 
all of our apps, of course, let you sync data from one device to another. But OmniPlan, in particular, you want to be able to communicate that project with all of the other members of your team, let them see what you're doing. So you can sync that plan up to a website and publish it as just a web page where people can browse it that way. You can sync it up to an other co copies of OmniPlan. So you're basically publishing to a location that usually is under your own control. Uh, you know, it could be our sync server, but it's not encrypted. So uh, <laughs> most of our customers prefer to have something that they are encrypting themselves because they have a lot of their project plans are sensitive. And so uh, you publish your plan up there. So you have shared your plan there. They can sync with it and pull in the details. When you make a change, that change gets shared again up to the cloud. And when they sync the next time, they will see that change annotated with who made the change and when. And if they want, they can, I propose something and the project manager for that particular project said, oh, that's not going to work. I'm going to revert that change. And so then they've reverted it back. I actually see a change coming back the other way saying, no, Dave said no on this thing. <laughs> and, and so that's sort of how the native syncing from one copy of OmniPlan to another works. But a lot of people, I think, you know, the project manager is in charge of the plan and other people may have input to the plan. They tend not to just edit the project plan directly. They tend to go to the project manager and say, here's what I want to see changed or what differently. Mm -hmm. And then the project manager thinks about it and thinks about how that affects the schedule and resources and everything else. And then publishes a new version of the plan for everybody to use. And that publishing mechanism doesn't have to be loaded back into another copy of OmniPlan. That's where we've, we'll publish the Gantt charts and lists of tasks for each resource and so on, just up to a website or to a calendar file. If you know, if some of the people on the project are using, say, Google Calendar, they can get just the list of the stuff they need to get done in there. And as they check those items off, we can automatically sync back the status reports to the project plan and say, oh, okay, they've now finished this piece of work and the next piece can begin, or, you know, other dependent actions can begin. And then have you considered any kind of OmniFocus integration or are the tasks and work being done by the two apps so different that that just wouldn't make sense? I think it definitely makes sense. Uh, and customers have, have been asking us for it for years. And, and the OmniPlanet team is working on that process right now. They were actually ready for syncing many years ago, but OmniFocus wasn't ready for syncing with somebody else. You know, obviously it synced your own devices, but you don't have to keep track of these explanations or who changed what when in, in that kind of world. So adding things like drop tasks helps with that. And as we get closer and closer to OmniFocus just being able to collaborate with itself, OmniFocus collaboration with OmniPlan is also a, a big, big goal of a part of that project. Gotcha. And then I'm right in thinking that OmniPlan in a solo shop environment is not really that appropriate. It's more for managing a team and a bunch of resources to schedule out. Is that right? Yeah. I have seen people use it in solo shop type projects, but mostly to develop proposals or something. Like, let's say I'm a contractor and I'm, I want to say, here's how I'm going to renovate this room. And so we're going to start by, you know, I don't know what the steps are because I'm not actually a contractor, <laughs> right. but whatever. The, uh, let's, let's say I'm a software contractor. I'm working on a software contract. Well, first I'm going to go meet with you and talk about the, you know, gather requirements and figure out what your business is and what you need to do. And then we're going to, and so on. So we, we list out the steps, kind of how much time we think each of those things will take. And then OmniPlan has this, you know, several different forms of output now that, that are available for you to share with, with people easily. And, and some people really appreciate seeing that Gantt chart timeline to understand, here's sort of what I should expect from this project, and here's where things could go wrong, or here's what the critical path is. Where if one, and the critical path being the line of dependencies in the project, where if any one of those things takes longer than expected, then the whole project is going to take longer than expected. Uh, and OmniPlan is great for helping identify those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So with that, let's move on to iOS 13, which is a very soon to be out. First up, a dark mode. It's now a system-wide feature. When working on this feature, did you guys consider users that may want to override the system setting and having your apps always in dark or light mode, even if the system doesn't say it should be that? We have, because we... Had, we came across that same thing on the Mac uh, in advance. So, uh, and because we, you know, the system has always had light mode on iOS and no dark mode, but we knew that some customers wanted dark mode already. I think most of those customers are happy to just put the whole system into yeah. dark mode and then be done with it. But we did find on Mac that people appreciated having a separate preference where they could say, okay, Omni focus, I want you to be in dark mode now or in light mode now. It's a little bit tricky on you know to pass some of that state around but it's it's actually not too bad because of the way apple designed the frameworks you just have a top level context that says here's the context for the current window is it in light mode or is it in dark mode right 
And am I right in thinking you guys don't sync preferences from like Mac to iPad if like you had that set up on Mac, there it wouldn't be synced over to iPad in some way? Right, that's okay. correct. I mean, we there are some settings we do sync, uh, so we call those settings, and then the things that we don't sync, and we call those just preferences. Yeah. That's sort of our our internal distinction between the two. And then multi window support's coming, and I can see this being pretty useful, especially as you mentioned, people have the forecast mode open as kind of as their dashboard. And now they'll be able to have that plus a certain project to open if they want to. Absolutely, yeah. What kind of impact have you seen kind of using the betas this summer? With, with your apps? Well, I'll say that the OmniFocus in particular, I have not seen what the effect is because it's still working on getting two windows side by side. That's a huge change yeah. for OmniFocus it didn't, because it didn't have a notion of multiple databases or anything. So it was, you know, where to draw that isolation is a hard problem. It's getting close now and I'm hoping, hopeful that say maybe in another week or so, maybe by the time this podcast is published, it'll be ready to go into test flight and have people doing that. But but the version that's in test flight right now does not have multi-window support at all. Or or maybe I should say, this is internal right. test flight, if you do try to drag out a second window, it immediately crashes. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, which is better than it immediately you know, corrupting your work right, or something. Yeah. Or, or the problems like if you tap on something to navigate into something, well, all your windows would navigate into it at once. And, you know, those are the sorts of problems we have to fix right now before it's ready for prime time. So it's a big project. In our document-based apps, the problem's a little bit simpler because they were already based around multiple documents, and each window now just hosts a document, as I was mentioning earlier. So we have to get that state from your local window and you know find its way from where I am to the document, but at least it's always clear through that mechanism. So there I've already seen, you know, it's great to be able to have the file browser open on the left side. You could do this with just the Files app, I guess. And you drag a file off to the right, and now it'll open a new window side by side where you've got the file browser for Outliner side by side with an outline being open. Right. It's more useful in that you can now open two outlines at once or five outlines at once <laughs> in different you know spaces. Yeah, it's just nice not to have to think about closing documents all yeah. the time the way that you were sort of going up and down inside our apps before if you ever wanted to navigate from one place to another. Right. And then Shortcuts is getting another huge update. I know the last iterations of Shortcuts, you guys did a really good job just with like OmniFocus of being able to build out these custom shortcuts. How is this new version of shortcuts going to impact, I guess, the work you guys are going to be doing next year or later this fall on supporting this and how will this make automation even better? Well, we'll have some updated shortcuts ready out right out the gate when iOS 13 launches. Uh, some of the stuff that we're doing now, the big change to the way shortcuts work in now in iOS 13 is that you can read data and not just write it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or send it to an app. Tell, tell it to do an action. And you can tell it to do actions and the, without bringing that app forward, right? That they can, it can be in the background and so your shortcut workflow can kind of continue on to whatever it wants to do next. Of course, that's really essential if you're trying to read something and then do something with it. That's the big thing about shortcuts. Now that you can do searches, say I want to find all of the tasks that match this text, or you know, similar to the spotlight search that you can do by hand right now that we've already built supporting Domini Focus for, well, this would just be a an automated spotlight search in effect that would then go find a bunch of items or give me a list of projects and now find all of the things inside that project. We have some challenges on that front because we don't actually have the full database available to the extension yet without doing a big architecture change that we don't have time to do this summer. I don't know how much history you necessarily <laughs> want to hear there, but the database, iOS has had this limitation where they could suspend your app at any time right. or suspend your background extension at any time. And if you suspended something while it was trying to access the database, well, anything else that tried to access the same database would get locked up. You'd be in trouble. I understand that, like Marco had some trouble with this one uh, in some versions of Overcast where he was trying to do stuff both in the extension and in the main app, mm -hmm. and uh, things would lock up. So you have to instead sort of publish your information off to another location. And in order to keep every action that you do, you know, a reasonable speed, we try not to do that publishing stuff too often. So we tied it into our Spotlight search publishing that we were already doing. As you change actions, they, they show up over there. But that means you can read data, but you can't necessarily read every piece of data, like some stuff we didn't bother publishing this Spotlight, like projects that have already been dropped, because we just thought you shouldn't overload it with that. Right. And editing is a little bit harder until we sort some of this out. Like we have some very minor specific edits that we support already, like coming from the watch or coming from widget, uh, so you can check things off. That was certainly something we could support in a shortcut today without an architecture change. But you know, fields that don't appear on the watch or in shortcuts, like maybe setting the re how the repetition stuff goes, that would be harder. 
Yeah. And then the last question I have, external display support. More people are hooking up iPads to external monitors with USB-C being a thing. Have you guys considered special support such as, say, OmniGraffle, the external display would show the full document at all times while you're zooming in and editing in, on the iPad or kind of forecast mode for OmniFocus while you're doing other things on the iPad screen? Yeah, we sure have. Well, <laughs> one of the interesting things is that when you take a multi-window app and you plug it into a, an external monitor, yep. it immediately throws up a separate window up there on that other monitor just of your app and its kind of base configuration. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, which is really, I don't, I don't know if that's a bug or the, it, you know, in the current <laughs> iOS 13 beta or what, because yeah. if, if, for example, you plug in this external monitor and you open the notes app, like let's say people were watching what you were doing, you were showing it on the screen, you open the notes app, now suddenly it's just showing you your default notes list instead of whatever you're actually doing. And that's not great. It's not uh, appropriate yeah. at all. <laughs> uh, so the same thing actually happened when we first started showing in a meeting, you know, one of here's how our great new side by side window support works in uh, in Omni Outliner. And I open it up and try to put it on the screen. And on my iPad, you see the two outlines side by side, or yeah. the two Graffle documents side by side. And on the screen, you just see the document file browser picker. And you can't actually interact yeah. with it at all. Yeah. So that's disabled yeah. now. <laughs> and instead, we mirror our own content from whatever's going on in the main screen off to that external screen. But yes, absolutely, I can imagine there being times where you'd want to put other content up there. I think it would need to be selectable, so you'd need to... Like, the keynote case is really right. obvious. All right, I want to present this stuff up there. OmniGraffle already has a presentation mode, and I could imagine that if you say, I want to start going into presentation mode and you're in mirroring mode, we would just put the presentation content straight onto that display and locally you could still browse around and see, you know, where are your other canvases and be able to interact with them differently. And OmniPlan, I think, also has a, a strong use case for, you know, maybe you just want to see a Gantt chart up there. But there I think you would need to be able to scroll at least. So, yeah, each one of the pro apps kind of needs to do his own thinking about what goes on that external screen and probably put that into the user's hands in some way. Right. Say, here's here's what I want to show. Yeah, it'd be nice in future versions if that external accessibility mouse could be used on the external display for interacting with that in some way. Yeah, that would be interesting. Wouldn't it? But yeah, not today. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much, Ken, for your time today. It's It's been really great catching up about all the different Omni Group apps. Where can people go to find more information about uh, all the different apps we've talked about today? Well, of course, they can go to our website, omnigroup.com. Excellent. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. And yeah, excited to see all these updates push out in uh, the coming weeks here with iOS 13. And I'm sure you guys are really busy at work as this is almost out. Yeah, well, it's been great to see it coming together. There's a lot to do. <laughs> it's been a very, very busy summer. I don't know if all of the pieces will be ready on launch the way we always try to have them be, but we're looking forward to having them ready as, as soon as they can be. And of course, getting test flights into customers' hands as soon as we can as well. I think the new iPad OS is you know one of the biggest leaps forward we've had in in many many years so it's fun to see this happen yeah absolutely well yeah thank you so much for your time ken i really really do appreciate it thank you tim thanks again to ken case for his time recording this episode and to the omni group for sponsoring this episode of ipad pros once again head on over to omnifocus.com to try omnifocus for free you can send your feedback to me at ipadprospodcast at gmail.com as a reminder, you can get access to my nearly two-hour interview with Ken from 2010 by supporting the Patreon at patreon.com slash iPadPros. Listen in until after the exit music to hear a clip from that episode. Thanks again for listening to this episode of iPad Pros. In fact, the uh, the talk that I gave at our you know company wide meeting just a few days later was you know that this is really where I felt all of our desktop platform would be as well. That the touch interface I think just makes a lot more sense for well, if if you imagine aliens coming down, someone I, this is not my analogy. Somebody else <laughs> mentioned this recently, but if you imagine aliens coming down and watching us use our computers, you know what makes more sense: reaching out and touching the screen and manipulating the stuff directly, or reaching over here to this thing that's lying on a surface nearby and then trying to move it to manipulate the stuff on screen. It's um, uh, or if you if you try to teach computers to um, you know to young children and you 
uh, or, or to older people as well and explain how to use the mouse and that you have to make sure that the mouse cord is always at the top. You know, these sorts of things that we don't think about anymore once we've learned about it. But when somebody picks it up for the first time and they're trying to do it and they, they do move the mouse and it's turned sideways and it ends up going to the right instead of up and they're like, why does that happen? I'm like, oh, you've got to turn this one, align it up right. <laughs> when you move then the mouse up to, uh, to go over the, the scroll bar and then tell them, all right, now you press down and now you drag down and now uh, that other thing's going to drag the other way. And, and <laughs> you know, if you compare that to teaching somebody how to use an iPhone or now an iPad, uh, I think it, it's clear that it's just a lot more intuitive uh, an interface to have this touch screen interface where you just reach out, you touch the thing you want, uh, you can jump back and forth between two elements on the screen. You know, it, it, as fast as you can press two keyboard, two keys on a keyboard that are spread apart from each other, you can press two buttons on a touch screen that are far apart from each other because you can just put your fingers in in those two places. Uh, whereas if you try to do something like that with a mouse, you'd be, be tired after about three iterations and, um, and not very accurate. You wouldn't be able to go nearly as fast. Um, which, you know, if you ever, if you have access to the iPhone or iPad simulator and try typing on its keyboard with your mouse, it, <laughs> you start to see just how, how awkward an interface that is, really. Um, compared yeah, to just I don't think... Out, touching uh, I don't think many people have seen little kids for the first time interacting with with a computer and it's there's a real disconnect between what they're trying to do because of that mouse yeah. and screen. Yeah, so I think, you know, if some years down the line, there a lot of people are going to view... I, I don't think the mouse and keyboard are going away anytime really soon, especially the keyboard, right? I don't think you can... Um, yeah, it's helpful to have a physical keyboard to type. And I think developers will at least need the full desktop to develop our apps for the iPad. Right. But it may start to get viewed the same way that we you know, view joysticks now, where it's, it's sort of an optional accessory. It's not a fundamental part of the computing experience the way... Right. Um, Whereas, you know, in the 80s, a joystick, if you get a computer without a joystick, what were you doing? <laughs> uh, yeah.